How did you find out that the victim was leaving town the following day? Uh, I can't remember that good. Was it from a blog? Objection, Your Honor. Meeting. It's not leading, Your Honor. Was it from a blog? Yes, ma'am. Okay, what blog was that? The blog was Wendy. No. Do you want yes. the culpable parties held accountable for murdering the father of your children? Absolutely. I'm grateful they're already in jail. But not if it's your family. It's not my family. I mean, somebody hired them, right? Not necessarily. Somebody paid them. I learned something this morning. <laughs> yeah, me too. You didn't want them held accountable if it was your family members. Didn't you tell law enforcement that? That's not what I told law enforcement. What did you tell law enforcement? I told them that the person who did this should be held responsible and that I had nothing to do with it. Page 122, lines 7 through 12. If somebody tried to kill my ex-husband, they should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. The investigator says, regardless of who it is, and your answer is, I mean, it would be different if I thought it were my brother. But I don't think it was my family. Is it's what different I now, isn't it? No, it's not different. That's exactly it's different what today, I said right it? here. No, that's not no right. No further questions. You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Okay, how is everybody doing? Happy Wednesday. I did a special Tuesday show yesterday. Thanks to everybody who caught it, talking all about my time, short time, working for Sean Diddy Combs. wanted to talk today about Wendy Adelson, if she did it. So this is really a thought experiment. Wink, wink, nod, nod. If she did it, why she did it. And I wanted to look at some of the patterns of her behavior, specifically in her relationships and specifically your relationship with Jeffrey Lacoste. Now, Jeffrey Lacoste was really the thing that got me into this case. I thought his police interviews were some of the most fascinating, some of the most insightful. And being someone who has always been pretty, I don't know, what do you call it? Pretty sensitive to to people who's always asked how do you know that how do you know that you just sort of I think women have that this kind of intuition from a very young age because we are the weaker biological sex that it is something that we inherently have to protect us and I was always asked, why, you know, why are you sensing this about someone? Or why does this, why do you feel that? And I would say, I don't know. I just feel it. And Jeffrey Lacoste had a lot more reasons than just feeling it. But he put out a pretty strong case as to Wendy Adelson being an antisocial personality. And I would say that this is a family. I've talked about it before many, many times that I believe that this is a family of antisocial personalities. And there are all kind of now, because there's no real loyalty, so it became after Dan Markell's murder, the family really sort of became closer and, and also geographically closer because Wendy Adelson 
moved down to her parents real quick. They all became closer and they're all telling themselves the same thing. And I'm sure they talk about it much in the way that we've heard on these phone calls. Oh, well, you know, who could have done this? We had nothing to do with this. And I want to thank Fancy Fiction. This is something she put up on her Twitter. And I know that we've all, I don't know if we've all seen it before. I certainly had, but, you know, I really thought she made a really insightful point here about the text messages between Wendy and Donna. Donna. And so let's just take a look. This is from Fancy Fiction's Twitter. The link is in the description of this episode. So Wendy writes, Dear Mom, I know you are upset by the verdict, but the anger at me is not justified. I am not responsible in any way for Charlie's situation. Isn't that funny? Well, we know, I mean, yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. Certainly, certainly you wanted it to happen. You, you know, I hear different things from people. I think that Wendy was really the, the catalyst. I think she's very manipulative. I think she, I think everybody was on board with this idea. I just would love to know the the day that this whole family decided to do this, decided that this was a great idea to leave her children, Donna and Harvey's grandchildren without a father, that that was, was all would, would be best. I, and, and cause a, a ripple of grief that still reverberates through so many different communities, not just the Markell family, where they're really sentenced to a life sentence of grief, but, if you're listening to the victim impact letters I read at the end of each episode, far reaching, it's like a pebble thrown out and just ripples, 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 ripples. And this was more like, I don't know, giant wave of grief that spread out from this one horrible crime. And then all the destruction in Katie's family, not that I feel sorry for them, but Luis Rivera, Sigfredo Garcia. I am not guilty. Okay. She says, I am not responsible in any way for Charlie's situation. I am not guilty because I did not do anything wrong. And I was not involved in any way with Danny's death. So here we have all these admissions, uh, what I perceive as admissions in the negative here. When I was interviewed by the police and testified in court, I told the truth. So a lot of, <laughs> a lot of gaslighting. Uh, as I was required to do, I cannot control how the prosecutor used my statements in Charlie's trial. Also, as you know, my lawyer has advised me not to talk to my family and anyone else about this case. I have followed this advice despite your disagreements with his guidance. Please do not te test text me about this case anymore. If you have anything further to say about this case, Please go through our lawyer. Right now, I have to be singularly focused on taking care of the boys during this difficult time. So very much like what she said at the police station. I have to be with my parents. I have to, I have to get out of here as quickly as possible. I have to be with my parents. I'm not in my right mind. I need help parenting. And this is very much reads like a text message saying, hey, your text messages might be one day evidence, which they were. And I'm not going to write anything incriminating. I'm only going to write things that make me look good. And if you listen to Charlie's wiretaps, very much the same thing. Well, he would talk very incriminating, uh, very incriminate himself. 
and then put in, well, I wasn't involved and you don't know anything and you're still working in the office, right, Katie? Type stuff. Remember that? So Fancy Fiction wrote, <laughs> just really funny, just a normal mother-daughter text exchange. So perfect. And Donna writes back. So, so and if you remember the jailhouse calls between Charlie and Donna. So Charlie's really upset because he feels that Wendy really blew it by driving by the crime scene, buying the bullet bourbon or the bullet rye whiskey. Because anyone in their right mind, they're very in tune, these antisocial personalities with how they're perceived. Anyone would look at that and say, she was making sure the job was done. This is a murder by hire. Why did she have to drive by, do this three-point turn when the police catch her eye, and then lie about it on the stand? So Donna's not having it. So Donna writes back. One minute, please. Hold on one second. She writes, what? Oh, oh, she writes back. Okay. We have no desire to speak to you about the case. I guess dad and I are just shocked that you don't think of coming to see us or even calling us. So now, she, so now Donna's playing the victim, right? <laughs> we are your parents. We are and have always been there for you and for the boys. We were especially there for you. You guys remember? You remember, Wendy, when we were there for you, when you had that problem, that problem up north? We were all there for you. And now that, and now that our, our lives are ruined, you won't even call us. You won't see us. Your poor old Jewish mother. We are your parents. We are and have always had your best, have been there for you and the boys. None of what we wrote matters about the case. That's over. There is no more case. Oh, wait, didn't she say that? Right. Oh, wait, sorry. She says... <laughs> Sorry, none of what we met, we wrote matters about the case. That's over. I just want you to know how many how how many times over. Oh, I just oh that's over. I just want you to know how many times Charlie is asking about you, about his darling baby sister. I mean, that's what you say. Your little your your. Your middle child, the middle child is asking about his baby sister. He just wants to know if you're okay and you don't come around. Not because you don't want to be associated with your criminal family, right? Okay. Back to the back to the note. I'm I'm improvising here. Okay. Back to the back to the text. All right. Not only did you not ask us about, but you but not one question about Charlie. We will need to give you some information shortly. And we need some business assistant. Please. Now she gets like business-like here. This is like her sincerely yours, Donna, your mother, part of the text. Please let us know if you can be of any help. If not, we will try to find someone who can help. This needs an immediate reply so I can start asking other people to help. Don't get nervous. Again, nothing, nothing in capital letters about the case. Just wanted to show you some business stuff and personal things. If you can't do it, we must find someone else who can, right? Even though they were very old, and infirm and have done nothing but help you all our life and raise you and, and love you. 
We'll find someone else if we must, Wendy. Someone else. <laughs> That's what she means. I hope you can understand it has nothing, nothing to do with the case. There is no more case. By the way, you said you have to focus on the boys. Have you told them? So Donna's not above using emotional manipulation when she has to. Very much like her daughter. Just pretty interesting. Thank you, Fancy Fiction, for putting that together. You know, th this was read out by Donna on the jailhouse calls, and Fancy put it together just as the text, as it was read. And you can really see... Wendy covering all her bases, Donna kind of just emotionally all, you know, using every emotional tactic that she can. So I wanted to look at, before we get into Jeffrey Lacoste, so when I talk about antisocial personalities, what am I talking about? What do I mean when I say that this is a family of antisocial personalities? What does that mean? What are they like? So I thought the NHS of so Britain had a pretty good checklist. Of course, it was made famous by Hare's checklist. Signs of antisocial personality disorder, exploit, manipulations, or people who like to who could violate the rights of others, lack of concern, regret, or remorse about other people's distress. So Donna can try to manipulate her daughter with all this, but it's not going to have any effect on Wendy. And you can hear in Jeffrey Lacasse's police interview, he says, he accuses her of being a sociopath. And she goes, I don't know if I'm a sociopath or not, but I don't feel bad about any of this. They don't have any, any, feel, any feelings of remorse or any real feelings of empathy towards other people. Behave irresponsibly and show disregard for normal social behaviors. Kind of like planning uh, begins with an M, <laughs> ends with an R. The murder have difficulty sustaining long-term relationships, be unable to control their anger, lack guilt, or not learn from their mistakes, blame others for the problems in their lives. Right? So Charlie blamed Wendy. Charlie blamed the jury. Charlie blamed Tallahassee and, and Donna. It's... and. Then you can see in Wendy's testimony, it's all just speaking of the kosher food. It was that she got kosher style food. It wasn't that she totally disregarded Dan's kosher, Dan and his kosher guests who eat kosher. It was that Dan misunderstood that she was getting Nathan's hot dogs. That's what kosher style means. Cold cuts and Nathan's hot dogs at a very fancy dinner. It's complete. It's like saying we got a lot of vegetarian food because it had vegetables in it. it just had a lot of meat. What's wrong? We said we'd get vegetarian style food at this wedding. So it's everyone else's fault. They blame others for the problems in their life and they lack guilt or not learn from their mistakes and they would repeatedly break the law. A person with antisocial personality will have a history of conduct disorder during childhood, such as truancy, not going to school. This is not true for not, what I understand about Wendy, but Charlie certainly had trouble graduating dental school. Delinquency, for example, committing crimes, and our uh, disruptive and aggressive behaviors. They can misuse substances, also be very indiscriminate 
and have multiple relationships going at the same time, multiple partners. It's, it's just, they're, it's all about no empathy for anyone else. They enjoy manipulating other people. So that's what, what, what I'm talking about. And you can see before I get into Jeffrey Lacaz, I wanted to show you one other thing, which is how, what he describes the, so all antisocial personalities also are narcissists, but not all narcissists have antisocial personality disorder. And you can see here, whoop, I just want to show you the cycle of abuse. So you have a defining event. This can be a fight, argument, actual issue, or a created crisis. No matter the reason for the drama, the peace and quiet has gone on too long. And then it goes into regaining control. The argument shifted power back to the nurse and the victim takes the blame and the responsibility, apologizing and calming the fight by giving in. Peace and quiet, the cooling down period seems peaceful and all is well in reality. The narcissist merely manipulating and gaslighting their victim. Life is peaceful as long as the, as the narcissist has their way. And then the tension builds up and it goes over and over again. This is the cycle of abuse. And often it starts with love bombing. And then there's also this uh, degrade and discard, right? So let me show you that real quick before I get into some of Jeffrey Lacasse's more insightful. We're not going to watch the whole thing. I edited it down. Try to fix the sound as much as I could. Um, is this the same thing? Hold on. But my apologies. So I wanted to talk about the discard phase. So, so at the end, when they're no longer useful, when they're no longer a supply, they these narcissistic personalities, I'm talking about Wendy and Donna, will dis discard. So they'll do this by emotional withdrawal, become distant or cold or unresponsive. They will devalue, criticize, belittle, or demean the other person, or they'll give them the silent treatment. And you'll hear in this, Jeffrey Lacoste is saying, it's really weird. Wendy doesn't want to be around me after her ex-husband's very strange very mysterious murder. What happened? What's going on? So let's just, actually, I'm going to take a quick break. 36 second break. And I'll meet you on the other side of the break. Be right back. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. If you are enjoying this episode of my true crime report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. All right. That was a little breather. Always feels good. The professor in the department is totally obsessed with her. You probably already got that. So this is pretty interesting. Let me know if it's too loud or too... I, I can't turn it up. I think this is as high as, as it goes. I moved it... Tried to move up the volume and clean it up a little bit. I don't know how I did. Let me know if it's too loud Jane's World, thanks so much. 
such a generous amount of material <laughs> oh, for more Roberta does Donna. Thank you. Yeah. Jane's world too has uh, been putting them up in my community tab. <laughs> now numbering four plus 10 minutes compilations. Yeah. Jane's world's too been doing compilations of my Donna. Some of, I think, I really like the last clip you used. <laughs> Does that sound narcissistic of me? I don't know. Thought it was funny. Um, so he starts out talking about two things. And I, I thought this way, I just kept this in. It's not so much about the relationship and his observations of Wendy. But, but I thought it was interesting. He says, Wendy had this other professor who called her a goddess. Clearly, Wendy would have brought up this person as a possible suspect or this student who kissed her on the mouth. And we know that there were rumors that were put out by the police that they found some kind of, I believe it was put out by the police, correct me if I'm wrong, that they had found some kind of adult material on Wendy's phone connected with teacher student kind of things and he thought well did anyone bring jeffrey lacoste is asking the police did anyone bring up these two people and of course wendy didn't bring up these two people she seems totally focused on amy adler who was dan markell's he was very happy with her girlfriend jonathan adler's sister she's a law professor she here in New York City, very, very beautiful woman, knockout. She she must have been such a source of jealousy for Wendy. Very beautiful, very smart, ran in circles that Wendy could only dream about. And everything that when she found out that Jeffrey Lacoste could no longer be her, be her scapegoat, really, she changed to Amy Adler's ex-husband as if that makes any sense. To me, the most sense, I would say, would be to bring up the idea, if I were Wendy, if I were this horrible, dark human being who did this, I would try to connect it with Dan Markell's work with the, with the prod father case. The case of the orthodox rabbi in in Brooklyn who let's say got divorces for women in very godfather like ways let's put it like that okay <laughs> so he brings up these two people and of course Wendy hasn't hasn't brought these things up at all so let's take a listen. He was a he's kind of really bad teeth. I don't know his name. He called her goddess, and he would send her inappropriate texts. I can't imagine that Wendy wouldn't have mentioned that, but just to make sure he had it. Um, he's an older guy, probably in his 60s. I don't know his name, but he called her goddess. And he's no fan of Markel. Who you're talking about. Is that too loud? Let me know. Or is it about right? Let me know. Um, so, of course, Wendy hasn't brought this up. What I mean by the prod father is that Dan Markell was working with the defense, meaning working for the, the lawyers for the Orthodox rabbi and Orthodox Jews who were who were running that run, running that racket they and one of the lawyers was was Keith Ranieri of Nexium's lawyer Mark Agnafel uh fellow so i would say oh maybe someone didn't like his work with the prod father case but never brings it up so what i i bring it up to say she was only interested in this idea of a jealous guy, someone angry and jealous and wanting revenge, which I think is really interesting. And I think 
that there's real themes of jealousy from Wendy's part to Dan to Amy Adler. So Wendy could it was did not have the respect of her peers. She did not have the prof blog. She wasn't this, she was an achiever, but she could never really, she, she always felt like she was in Dan Markell's shadow. And the way she put it was that Dan Markell had no interest in reading her stuff or promoting her work. And everyone, or everyone but Wendy says that's nonsense. So she always paints herself as the victim every time. And this is a theme in my podcast. If you, if you learn one thing today, it's that these victimizers, these antisocial personalities are so good at reversing things and always playing the victim. So whether I'm talking about an innocence fraud case and they've gotten at, they've gotten themselves out on a bunch of nonsense, they're so lucky to be out. It was that they were terrible. The prosecutors were terrible. They were victimized by the prosecutors, victimized by the police, victimized in prison. And they totally erased the victim and, and their family, the, the real, real victims in the case. They're masters at, at deception and reversal. I haven't talked to him specifically, but it seems unlikely we have to do to one everything. Um, and there was a, this, this was one I thought of. Um, there was a student in the fall that was really inappropriate with her. She forwarded a couple of emails to me. And he actually kissed her on the mouth during a teacher student meeting in her office. That was kind of weird. So I don't know his name or anything else, but there was the student that, if you're looking for obsession, that was strange for a student to lean in and kiss a professor on the mouth. You know? Yeah. So it's just, um, I wouldn't even know the name. She forwarded the email. She was disturbed. But I don't okay. know, you know. If you really needed it, I have that email somewhere. So my question is, what did Wendy think that she was going to get from Jeffrey Lacoste by forwarding that to him? Besides absolute jealousy and possessive feelings. So it's a, a way to kind of manipulate Jeffrey Lacoste. What can he do about it? He's a professor at FSU in social work. But what can he do? It's not his student. What, do, what does she want him to do? And if I had to guess, it would be become even more beholden to Wendy, more protective of her. And give more of his energies to her. It's a very clever way of manipulation because in reality... Oh, Mary Kate, how do you know? Never happened. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, kiss never happened. Yeah, that's where I was going with this. So, yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was really skeptical of this. It's just, a, it seems to me like a really easy way to control Jeffrey Lacoste and get him really worked up because he is, he says in this, I'm a Mr. Rogers kind of guy. I work with with victims and and of course Wendy likes to to have that public persona so what I've been thinking a lot about in this case is the worst thing for Wendy is the is her ultimate punishment if she never and I hope this doesn't happen if she never gets charged with this crime is her is her punishment really to be publicly exposed, to have the mask lifted. This is a family that lives beyond, behind a mask, a mask of perfection, a mask of, of connected and, and caring family. Oh, hold on one second. Sorry. It's my, <laughs> my, brother, my foster brother called me. Called him back afterwards. So... Is, is that the ultimate is that the ultimate punishment no that's my cell phone <laughs> it just sounded so loud didn't it i just got a new phone and i turned my my new phone down but not my old phone i thought it had run out of power but apparently not <laughs> so is that the ultimate punishment to be demasked to be out there to be 
to be exposed. And she wears these masks so well, you know, I'm, I'm the crusading lawyer. I'm the, I'm the dedicated mom. And she uses props. If you listen to my first episode I did with Sonny Tanner, went to the trial, she talks about her shoes and not in a way, she said, I really just focused on these shoes. Why did she get so dressed up head to toe? And then she has these old sort of Mother Hubbard-like shoes. And I said, because she knew she was going to be, this is my thought on it, photographed mostly from the waist up. So she really only had to look good, but the jury would see the shoes and say, oh, well, she's just a mom. So it's like we make a million of these impressions every day. And we, and, uh, we think these people are safe because they're a mom or because they do this kind of work. It's kind of a identity that they can take on where people will think that they're I hate this term, but a good person, because I think it's much more complicated than that, without ever having to really, with, with while, while doing exactly what they want, so they can have the look of a good person while doing exactly what they want. Um, might have spent a cocky student trying to pick up his hot prof, I don't know, you know, but... If you can find it, just you got my email address. Yeah, just would you like to see that one? Okay, sure. I'll send you yeah. email. I think his address is on it. Um, yeah, we, haven't, we haven't excluded anyone really at this point. Gotcha. So. Okay, a couple other things. Um, I've been seeing a therapist since about, uh, I don't have any major mental health problems, but just to try to deal with Wendy, I was seeing my therapist I used to see when I was going through my divorce. So um, I was thinking about what we talked about in there. I mean, I've spent like $2,000 on therapy. So he's about to go into this whole spiel. Like you got it. You guys got to look at Wendy. You have to look at Wendy and this police officer. And I wonder if this is because of the DA makes as he, I think this is before he went out and said, we're not going to ever charge the Adelsons. But basically they just looked at him as a jealous uh, boyfriend and really normalized anything that Jeffrey Lacoste says until he meets Craig Isom and Craig Isom gets it much more psychologically in tune. And we've all been that person, like the sky's falling, the sky's falling. Don't you see, don't you see it's like this? And the other person's like, no, it's just normal. What are you doing picking this all apart, right? Be trying to figure out how to deal with Wendy. She's been really hard to handle. Um, and I realized I, I never put it together, but um, he for months has been concerned that she's a sociopath. And I didn't tell you guys that before. I, lo I still love Wendy. I was under her spell. She called me tomorrow if I go back to her. But there's a lot of stuff that, as I look back, is really strange. Just to give you a couple examples. Well, I guess one of the things I worry about is Wendy has this public persona. And uh, she's a very good actress, and she's very charismatic, and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and she knows a lot of people, you know, everybody in Tallahassee knows Wendy, you probably discovered that already. I mean, she's in every social circle, you know, she's very social butterfly-esque and out there and stuff. But in terms of people that know her intimately, have spent like a lot of time with her and seen behind the curtain, you know, no. No. I think it's uh, Markel, me, and maybe that sack guy in the last 12, 13 years. I mean, she doesn't, you know, you know what I mean? So some of the stuff I had seen, it's pretty crazy stuff. I mean, no sense of guilt, no empathy, hypersensitivity to criticism. When I said, hey, you cheated, I mean, that's fucked up. She would not apologize. She would not say she felt bad. She would not say she made a mistake. Um, she's a total pathological liar. And I, I feel bad saying all this because I still love her. She has these flaws and I would have stayed with her. But uh, if you look back at Markel's legal documents, he's constantly talking about her systematic pattern of deception how she lies all the time. And she told me once, I have a really hard time telling the truth when it's inconvenient or unpleasant. I lie all the time. I mean, she said that to me. See, isn't that interesting that Wendy is so aware of who she is? So I believe she knows that she's an antisocial personality. I believe Donna knows this about herself. 
She's very aware of what she does, very aware of how her mind works. And she says, I have a hard time telling the truth. And we saw it all on, on our screens in, in these trials, testifying, where she would make up these ridiculous things like the kosher style food, the banana bread story that Dan Markell, the last time he saw Donna, she gave him a hug and a kiss and gave him some banana bread that he couldn't possibly eat. Thanks, Stark Work, for that insight. Stark Work wrote me, it was like, look, look, he can't eat this. He's kosher. What was? What is he going to do with this banana bread? Play football with it? What? It's not made in a kosher kitchen. It's not made from kosher ingredients. But it sounded good at the time. Oh, it's just a misunderstanding, just kosher style f- food at the wedding. Oh, I don't remember that. I don't remember. Check out the society pages. Great video. I don't recall. I don't remember anything. To Peter Gabriel's song, like, you know, I don't remember anything. I don't recall. I don't recall anything about the divorce. It wasn't that bad. Everything was actually really great between us. Just the convenient, whatever's convenient at the time, spit it out, say it. So I never would have thought that Wendy was, I know she didn't pull the trigger or anything like that. But the more I thought about it, how much I was manipulated and how much of a spell I was under and all that kind of stuff, I feel kind of creeped out right now that not, uh, I don't know if she's a suspect or not, the paper says she isn't. But as an accessory, it makes a lot of sense to me at a certain point. So, and I don't know that many people that, that know her that well. Mm-hmm. Um, when you see behind the curtain, she's a total, total train wreck. Uh, my psychologist was saying, man, she just meets the checklist of a narcissistic sociopath, you know, go down the list. So, obviously she's already a person of interest and all that kind of stuff, but I thought you should know that my, I'm a mental health myself. I'm a, right. So um, I never saw that when I was under the spell, but I've had people trying to convince me for three or four months, you're dating someone. So that's what that means. I'm in mental health. He's trying to persuade the detective. I'm in mental health. I know these things. I'm not just a nut. I'm not just a disgruntled ex-boyfriend. I'm not just angry because we broke up. And at this time, he's still under Wendy's spell. He's still saying he loves her and he cares about her. And he's upset that Wendy won't talk to her, talk to him, doesn't want to be around him. Because Jeffrey Lacoste has Wendy's number. And the one of the more interesting things he says in this interview, I think it's the next interview with Isom, is that the worst thing that you can say to Wendy is to remind her that she's not perfect. So here he is being blown off, dismissed. He was real. The real truth teller in the story. It's kind of interesting because narcissistic families, you know, do the same kind of thing to the truth teller in the family. They get to be the scapegoat. Most severe sociopathic tendencies. Right. So high functioning and attractive, but still, you know, that. Yeah. So that, that's something I just thought I should tell you. Sure. Well, I just noticed that Markel, everybody's told me what a nice guy Markel is, and I thought he was sated, because in our household, I mean, he's a psychopathic, stalking, emotionally abusive, controlling jerk. That's how Wendy thinks of him. Now I know and it's that, it, Who does that sound like? Psychopathic, controlling, stalking, narcissistic jerk. Who does that sound like? Dun, 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 dun. So someone sounds like their first name ends in an I. <laughs> Does it sound like someone named Lindsay Badelson, maybe kind of rhymes with that? What projection, huh? And that's her. And I'm not saying, you know, we all have our our down points, you know. And I think Dan Markell certainly had to have an ego to do the kind of work that he did. 
But those features are features that I associate with with uh, Wendy and Don and Donna. Donna, oh, that text message is so great. It's not about the case. There is no more case because he's been convicted because you drove by the crime scene, Wendy. You drove by the crime scene and then you bought the bull of bourbon. You did it, Wendy. You. And you left your poor old Jewish mother to flee to a non-extradition country and then to get arrested and not even see the ward. They wouldn't even show me the ward. And then they had to transport me with no water. It was like being in the Sahara Desert for hours and hours. It was torture, Wendy. That trip was torture. <laughs> Keeping me in a paper gown under observation. <laughs> oh, the Donna, the Donna sob stories never end. Her assessment of him. Yes. Do you have the same assessment of him? Um, I did when I was with her because I didn't know. I just believed her. Right. You know, but uh, no one else says. What I hear from everybody else is he's an arrogant dick. As far as a academic, there's a lot of professors that are arrogant. You know. Sure. Um, but 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 he's a good man. That's what I hear people saying. He was right. a good father. He was a good man, and he was really upset with Wendy. Um, starting to understand why. I mean, there's some timing things here. I hope this is all wrong and you find some disgruntled student that shot him. I might want Wendy and her kids to have a good life in South Florida, you know. I still love them, I still care about them, I miss them, I'm pretty heartbroken over all this, but if you want information, I had some things to say. Um, so we have this big fight in Gainesville, and I really confront her, I'm really hard on her, I'm, I'm pissed because I feel like I've been conned, because I, you know, she's been calling me her boyfriend and all this kind of stuff. And I don't know exactly what the relationship was with Sack, but I found out enough that it was very clear that she was busted, that she was juggling two guys in some form or fashion. I don't know the details. Mm -hmm. I got the impression I was boyfriend number two is why I was pissed. I mean, there's not a, no picture on the Facebook page. I noticed there wasn't even a picture of me in her house. And that's when I got really, really upset. I was like, this, come on, we've been dating nine months. This is bizarre, you know? Um, so I had it out with her in Gainesville. And then she went to South Florida for 14 days. <sighs> the whole time she's down there, She's miserable and not that available. But we're talking about future-oriented stuff. We're talking about trying to get back together and desperate to see each other. It sucks that we're separated in this. Oh, Jeffrey Lacoste. She's desperate to keep you on so she can discard you so that you can become the useful idiot, the patsy, to drive by the crime scene, to be headed out right after. That's my view. And pretty much the view of everyone who's looked closely at this case. So it must have been very confusing. You know? Hold on one sec. Chewy, big night. Thank you so much. Uh, Charlie cheated and cut corners to get ahead. I'm convinced that Wendy used the same tactics and anyone who was with her long enough knew she was an imposter. Yeah, they, yeah, great point. Very interesting. Yeah, it seems like she, it, does, do I still have this? Hold on one second, Chewy. This is interesting. Hold on one sec. Let me see if I, I hope I still have it and I haven't. I think I may have pulled it down. Let me see. Oh, darn it. Darn it, I did. I used to have her book review. Someone really, I'll, I'll get it for next time I cover this topic. But someone wrote an early book review of hers and said, you know, these... She's using the stories of the victims that she helps within her legal work. And she's really how narcissistic she is and how she takes their takes their sorrow and uses it for her own 
to shine, uh, to to basically bask in the, in their shine, you know, to take on that moniker victim. And that's interesting that you think that she cut corners too. Would not be surprised. I just, it's very interesting in this Jeffrey Lacoste talks about how disappointed she was that she didn't get to give her speech. It wasn't that her children no longer have a father. It wasn't that her life was uprooted. So when people talk about why she did it or if she did it, why she did it, I really believe that the, for Donna, the most motivating factor was to be near the kids. And I think it was convenient for Wendy. She didn't like Tallahassee very much. And she didn't, and she didn't want to have to compromise. This is a family that does not compromise. They considered... Dan Markell, a dangerous zealot. But I think what really did it is that she was going to be publicly exposed for lying to the courts, possibly getting uh, admonished by the court and or have her law license taken away at worst. At best, she would have gotten it. At, uh, at best, nothing would have happened and it would have just been tossed Dan Markell's complaint. Uh, Dan Markell could have gotten an admonishment. She could have had her law license totally taken away for lying to the courts about her assets. And apparently, she was saying she had no jewelry, and we know that's not true. Bad situation. I can show you the text. Like, can't imagine my life without you. God, I fucking miss you. I mean, these are like exact quotes, you know. Um, she gets back to town, we go on a date, and I said it was awkward, but we were holding each other, we're holding hands, there was a future orientation still, we're going to spend a lot of time together and work this out, that's what we had decided to do, and that was last Monday. It gets really strange from there, and it makes me suspicious, and maybe I'm just paranoid, but then on Tuesday, she called me at 2 or 3 in the afternoon, and she said, I'm walked out of my house, so we're going to see each other that night. And I say, okay, walk out of your house, what are you going to do? I try to get a key, but I probably need a locksmith. I said, oh, well, I'll come out and we'll just hang out on your front porch and have our date there. And she's like super sweet and friendly. And it's like everything was okay, actually. She was like, I would love it if you would come keep me company, see you in a little bit, call each other baby, this kind of stuff. Um, when I showed up to yoga, and it ended up that she got into our house, we went to yoga together instead, and we just met there. When I showed up to yoga at 7, something was completely different. She was gone. I mean, and that might have been just her talking to her friend and said, you know, very interesting that when she was at her parents' house, she was telling Jeffrey Lacoste, I'm cleaning out my old room, almost as if she had pre-knowledge of this murder for hire that was going to go down. Hey, Starkwork, were your ears ringing? <laughs> Starkwork is a what, uh, had the brilliant insight about the banana bread. She said, this banana bread could not be happening. Kosher. Dan was kosher. How did, what did she think she was going to do with it? Thanks for becoming a member. Nice to see you here. And then they're also meeting on the porch and she's saying, was she packing? Was she packing the house? When I had Patty from Patty's Playhouse on, she was bringing up the point, when were these movers hired? It's very high, hard in Tallahassee to hire a mover on a moment's notice. All these things could build the case. All these very little details Listen to the episodes I've done with John Lewin, who's known as King of the Cold Cases, who tries or used to before he was exiled by George, D.A. George Gascon in California, a horrible D.A., for his speaking out against, John Lewin spoke out against George Gascon's pro-criminal policies, but he was running a very prestigious cold case unit there. They prosecuted cold cases, no body cases, the hardest of the hardest. And these, all those little details become very, very important. And I think that this is a very, now we're going on 
a decade with this, still without all the, in my view, all the co-conspirator, co-conspirators, excuse me, indicted. So all those little details will be very important. And then there's all the keys she made. What's that about? Stop them and she... She kept losing her keys and having to make more keys. What's what's that all about? Besides it, and that's it. I have nothing to do with your case. But I would be really curious to know if I was you, who she talked to between three and seven, because something happened where I seem to be irrelevant all of a sudden. And this has been this is after 15, 16 days mm -hmm. of her wanting us to, you know, let's just work this out. It just turned in a second. Thanks, Debbie. Roberta, Wendy said a friend of hers moved her things to Miami. Interesting. Thanks, Debbie. Debbie Martin knows so much about this case. And it gets a little stranger from there, actually. And this was Tuesday preceding the 18th? Exactly. Um, and you so at what point did she send you the email? That, that was that night. That was that Tuesday night. That was Tuesday okay. night, which I suspect was already in her head. Because well, that may have been she may have came to a finalization that she was going to do that. She and, may have. She may have. I mean, I don't want to make this all about me. There's bigger things here. But I did notice some things. I mean, so she's done with me, right? Okay. I'm looking at her. It's not right. Something's wrong here. I walk out to the car, and it's really awkward. Small talk, you know. I can tell she thinks I think she's done. But she asked me if I was going to be here this weekend. Now she's done. Why does she give a shit if I'm here Friday? She asked me directly, are you going to be here Friday? And I said, uh, maybe it's up in the air. And it wasn't up in the air. I just didn't want to seem desperate. And I was just going to stay here and not take my trip. If Wendy was willing to see me is what that was about. But she, said, I, but she was really interested. Oh, why is it up in the air? Oh, because, you know, here's Andrew's thing. Oh, okay, well, okay, talk to you. And this was prior to her sending you the email. Prior to sending me the email. And the last thing I ever heard from Wendy. Last thing, last words I exchanged with Wendy are, were, are you going to be here Friday? I just thought you should know that. It made me nothing, but it was kind of strange to me. And then the no contact order was also kind of strange to mm -hmm. me. Um, usually you would just send someone an email and say, hey, I need some time to think. She was very strict about that no contact thing. It was almost like she did. Right. And he's absolutely right with every single point he's making. And it's just all going over this detective's head. And I, I just find it so interesting the way he's describing it. He's much more effective the second time he's really strategized his arguments and says them with a lot more confidence to ice him. And I wonder how much of that is time away from Wendy and time to really process everything he's seen how much of it is detective isom being a much more receptive and perceptive audience but here he's just getting the brush off and this detective is it hale detective hale is just sort of normalizing all of these really red flag all these red flags normalizing it how depressing must have this been for and demoralizing for Jeffrey Lacoste? Don't want to be in front of me. You know, I just busted her. For well, she probably didn't want you to try and uh, talk her out of it. Maybe. I don't know. No, that's my thinking. Maybe. Or maybe she knew something was going to go down and want me in front of her. She didn't want to talk you out of it. Like, like, like Jeffrey Lacoste could have talked Wendy Adelson back into a relationship. Give me a break. I love that when, you, when you're trying to look open-minded. Maybe, maybe you're totally wrong, detective. Maybe you're way off the mark. Maybe you're not getting what I'm saying. <laughs> this, this woman is a monster. It's not because I'm a, a disgruntled boyfriend. It's not because I have a wild conspiracy theory. It's not because I want to see her locked up because I'm mad that she's broke up with me. Uh, what I saw was strange, very strange. I have her number. I'm in the mental health profession. You're not getting it. So instead, he's going to take the other route. And 
what I find really objectionable and, you know, people are fair to have all sorts of different opinions about the characters that come up in true crime cases, but who would want to be a witness in a true crime case? Who would want to, I mean, you've read the comments on law and crime or, or court TV as a trial is going on. The commenters read these people to filth from, from their demeanor to their outfits, to their hair, to their teeth, to their looks, to what they're saying. I mean, it is such a thankless thing to be a witness. And Jeffrey Lacoste, in my opinion, is one of the really more fascinating characters in this case and one of the more ad admirable characters in this case. Because I read her pretty well. And uh, I just bust around a whole host of lies, you know. Okay. So this part sounds crazy speculative. I just wanted to give you the information. Um, so that struck me as kind of strange. Oh, I don't know if you guys have seen this yet. This was just weird. This is just stuff. Have you seen this picture? Probably seen it in media accounts. Mm hmm. I mean, if you look at that picture, my friends that have, I don't have kids, my friends that have kids show up and say, look how narcissistic that picture is. Who looks good in that picture? Not Wendy's kids. Wendy. And this comes out Thursday night, she changes this. Mm -hmm. This is the one that you said she was uh, taunting you with? Or well, maybe. Or well, 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 my other friend, what, what, the other speculation in the community, which is not for me, is like, it's Wendy looks good, but... This is a Photoshop picture. Her dad does photography stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So she looks way better than normal in this picture. If you knew you were going to be all over the media, that's how one you would want to look. So that, may sound, that, that may sound crazy to you. But, you know, narcissism is based on Narcissus falling in love with his reflection. And it's not a real reflection. It's not a true reflection of who you really are. So there is Wendy, again, putting out of a fake, a uh, improved, a a filtered version of herself out into the public. It's so emblematic of the whole way this family deals. Oh, hey, Miss Shorty, thank you for mo being a moderator. Love being back on this Adelson trade. Yeah, I'll be. T uh, you know what? I buried the lead a little bit. There is news with Donna. If you haven't heard, her trial has been moved up, meaning sooner, not later, because of the Jewish holidays. Donna herself and Rashbaum have requested that it be moved up, and it's been unopposed, so it will be moved up two weeks. So jury, so let me look at my notes. I believe my memory is that it will start the 14th of September, jury voir dire and jury selection and all that so i want to thank murder by maestro it's miss shorty the society page all for moderating the comments and thank you all guys for being here please hit the thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already but just something to think about I mean, when you want to picture your kids, your kids look good. She's got, there's other pictures in this photo set where the kids looking at the camera and are smiling and look great. Right. So it's just weird. Um, and I'm not trying to do your job for you to be like an yeah. profiler, but it was a thing. Right. Um, All right, I'm going to move forward to when he comes back and talks to Detective Isom or I'll, uh, this is going to be maybe a little bit longer live stream, but I did cut this down. I did cut this down a bit or else, but I just wanted to show you the difference between Detective Hale and Detective Isom the, and the difference in time. So, and the difference in confidence. So he comes back and with a lot of confidence, a lot more confidence and a, and a lot more surety Jeffrey Lacoste does in what he's saying. And, and, and a, um, a real need to 
communicate what he knows to Detective Isom. And what I mean, um, that was okay. Hold on. Unbalanced, and I said, "Well, she seems upset about her divorce, but I don't know if she's unbalanced. I didn't take it seriously at the time." Uh, that sounds extreme, right? I thought these two people were having a nasty divorce. He's calling names. I thought it was Toyota wine. It's one of the reasons I was upset with him because it seemed, you know, you see in the court documents, I mean, he was he got sick of her and really went after her legally in a really aggressive way, and not knowing the background. I thought it was inappropriate, you know. So Wendy could have lost her law license, her teaching career, all those things that gave her social cachet, gave her power. Power is very important to antisocial personalities. All would have, all were in jeopardy. So when we talk about this is a crime done for the kids, for Donna, yes. And sure, it was convenient to be, she loved Miami, she loves Miami, and she likes being there. But for her, it's really to get under, from under Dan Markell's shadow, to get under his, uh, get out from under his control. But most importantly, to save her fake public persona. So this is what he's talking about. I, I just saw Dan Markell is so terrible. And I thought the court filings, because Dan Markell had really had enough and was not going to be trampled over anymore. He was really going hard. I thought I was taking things too far, trying to disbar your ex-wife, you know. Um, but one impression I'm left with is, I don't think I said this before, like in December or January, I thought that was totally out of line. By May, I don't know if those are technically the correct words, but by May, I knew exactly what he was talking about. And this is a very troubled person, Wendy Abelson, deeply troubled person. Um, and at first she's gorgeous, she's smart, she's funny. I might fell for this girl like a ton of bricks. Most men would, I mean, um, that was one reason I stuck around too long. But just an overall impression of her. Um, and Danny says this in court documents, actually, a very manipulative person, a pathological liar. Wendy was an alcoholic while I was with her. She drank her dinner most nights. Extremely fragile, extremely depressed. Mm -hmm. Many, many nights um, sitting in hated Tallahassee so much that I um, thought, thought we were a bunch of country bumpkins and we liked Tallahassee because she's from Miami. Didn't hide that fact. Thought it was bizarre that I moved here from Phoenix. And the two conversations that we had every single day for nine months were Danny is an evil monster. Tallahassee is the worst place in the world to live, and I can't believe I got stuck here because of Danny Markell. I mean, she was obsessed with those two concepts. So I got really tired of hearing that, but I heard that every day for nine months. Um, Wendy's very manipulative in that she plays the victim very, very easily. Whenever we got into a confrontation, she poor me. I'm very sensitive that I work with. DV victims, women of the victims, work, all that kind of stuff. So I'm so sensitive, Mr. Rogers kind of guy. So it's a very, you know, easy way to manipulate me or Markel for that matter. Um, but she just wasn't stable even in the fall. Um, and able to cover it up here or there. One of these people, the first 100 hours you spend with her, you think she's amazing. 101 on, you're like, get myself into here. This person's kind of crazy. You talk a little fast for me. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 100 hours. Yeah, first 100 hours you think she's amazing. <laughs> Then after that, wait a second, there's some tremendous flaws here. So she puts the. <laughs> this always reminds me of some of the women I went to Sarah Lawrence with. You'd meet them and you'd be like, this, this young woman is amazing. They're so charismatic. They know so much. And then, and then you spend a hundred hours with them and you're like, this person's nuts. <laughs> this person's, this person's more than just a little eccentric. This person might be deeply troubled. That's what that always reminds me of. But what he's saying is don't, Detective Isom, don't let her phony public persona fool you. Don't let the, don't be fooled by the mask. Underneath it is a very troubled woman who is capable of this. I don't feel I was heard last time. I work in this area. I have her number. Listen to me. I've never seen another police interrogation like this. Let me know if you've seen one close to this. I, 
I never have. That's been it's so perceptive. It's a very good public face. It's a calm. But as far as seeing stuff pertinent to the crime, I met her brother Charlie when I was down there in Miami for a mock. Very odd. And there's an odd dynamic between them. The whole family's a real weird heat situation. So he came off like a, an offender to me. He came off like a kind of sociopathic, like this is strange. He just met me, he's telling me this. It was really, really weird. Okay, I'm, I, yeah, you, you, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I, I know, I just, I'm, I'm just trying to rein you in a little yeah, bit ahead, so I can make sure I yeah. get it right. Yeah. 400 Korean people and just him, some of the men took offense and he got punched out. Charlie did. Yeah, so the way he handled that was to, but that was a big deal in our relationship. And right, because you see her there and she's with this guy and, yeah. and you don't know who the so he, he's talking about how weird it was. Charlie was telling these stories in a hot tub about getting revenge on a woman who humiliated him. And why would he tell this in front of his sister? He said they have this weird relationship, the family. So it's not just Wendy who seems to be an antisocial personality. It's also her brother. And I would, I would, I would continue on and say it's her mother and her father. And they all... Before this, before they got divided, because they're really kind of, when it benefits them, they would stick together in a very, kind of became an echo chamber. But now that Wendy wants to save herself, she's become the scapegoat. It's all Wendy's fault. None of us, it's never mind that Charlie ran his mouth like crazy. It's all Wendy's fault. She, she, we had a plan. She was supposed to stick with the TV. She wasn't supposed to drive by the crime scene. She wasn't, nobody told her to buy bullet bourbon. The guy, I'm a, I, if, maybe I got that wrong. You knew that she was well, seeing a guy. That's, that's one of the things. That if Wendy just followed the plan, but like Georgia Kappelman, the great Georgia Kappelman says, Wendy couldn't help herself. And for those of you who want to talk about this case, I have the Georgia Kappelman Appreciation Society on Facebook. It's just a fun place to talk about the case and pay our respects to the prosecutors who prosecuted the Don, who now going to prosecute Donna, successfully prosecuted Charlie, Sigfredo Garcia, made a plea deal with Luis Rivera, <laughs> and eventually took two tries, but got a conviction for Katie. The concern is that she would bring him up from time to time, and there was other signs. I mean, there's, I think, five to ten other men I was in denial about it in this time period that's not a crime obviously but it was she's very impulsive very erratic doesn't think things through she will do them and then worry about the consequences later she was remarkably sloppy about cheating on me in terms of um, well that's what was interesting up until about early June she was covering her tracks pretty well actually and uh, after that fight we had a huge not a huge fight. We had a mild fight about that, and uh, things started to get really, really strange. And this is why I think I had a hard time getting across to Investigator Hale. Um, so we have that fight. She goes to Portland for a weekend. She comes back. It's now June. And June, I was walking around saying to all my friends, "I don't know what, what is going on. Something is going on." We had that very frank talk about that and decided to stay together. Uh, she said, it's one guy, he's gone, he literally moved out of the area, as you probably know. So in June, I was walking around saying to my friends, uh, I don't know what's going on. It's just uncanny to think back on it now. I said, I don't know what's going on, but something's gonna happen. Like, it feels like there's drum beats. It feels like we're moving towards something. It's really, really strange. I don't know what's going on. Um, and one of the strange things that happened was we had a trip to California scheduled to see my parents the week that Danny was killed. And in early June, she rescheduled that trip. And I said, what's the problem with the trip? She says, well, I'm worried we'll get stuck in the airport and we won't be back on Friday. I have to pick up the kids from school. And I said, 
said, but we're coming back Thursday night. It's not winter. We're not going to Atlanta in the winter. I would understand. There's no way we're going to get. And we can we can rent a car. We have friends that could babysit. This is strange. Like, why? Did, I said, fine. Cancel the trip. Um, and that was going to be in early June. The trip. Yeah, she's afraid that they're going to get stuck in the airport in June. I mean, I mean, is that a dumb lie? It's almost like a lie that's put out there just to enrage him, just to get, just to, just to kind of irritate him. It's talking about the Tate brothers, and they had this technique where Andrew Tate. would he was had these men you know interested in, oh gosh anyway but he would get them upset with stupid lies like i need i can't do it because i'm gonna wa i have to wash my hair or something so we're gonna get stuck wouldn't it be better to say i'm afraid the i'm afraid of a I, i've developed a fear of flying something better than that what a stupid lie you know just something to just kind of rile him up and make him feel unimportant. And it's a big deal. Here they are. They're going to meet her parents. It's going to be the week that Danny was killed. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. That was. I'm sorry. His parents. I'm sorry. I misspoke. Sometimes it's more difficult talking and thinking at the same time. You're going to meet his parents. It's a big moment in the relationship. She's like, no, I got to be back. I got to pick up my kids for daycare. Never mind that we saw after, after, right, in the police videos, there's a million people willing to help her pick up her kids. But I, I have to be there. I have to be back. She had to be around it. She, It's so scary to think. She really wanted to see it. She wanted to be close to it. Right. She wanted to be there for for it to all go down. She had to be there. Yeah. Who's saying that? Rabbit. Thanks, Rabbit. Yeah, absolutely. She had to be back to get the children Friday, the day it happened, the day the crime happened. It's a trip. 11th to 19th was supposed to be the trip. So we had a trip planned and she was real, real strange about the fact that we had to reschedule this trip. It just didn't make sense. And I even said, if you just don't want to go because you don't feel comfortable right now, just tell me, that's cool. She goes, no, I have to pick up the kids from school that day. I just have to, I, I don't uh, I don't want to do anything to stop that, you know. I, and she said, I'll miss the kids at that point. I said, okay. A couple of days later, I say, well, she said, but I want to spend that time with you. Just, uh, I was leaving for Tennessee on Friday. She said, I want to spend that Monday through Thursday with you. I said, great. Uh, what, you want to go to St. Augustine? She loves the beach. She hates Tallahassee. This, again, is just very strange and suspicious to me. When Edison tells me, what I want to do is a staycation. I want to stay home in Tallahassee. I said, you, you want to stay in Tallahassee the hottest week of the year? She said, yeah, we'll go to Tom Brown Park. We'll do this. I said, you, you hate it here. I'm offering to take you away. Why wouldn't you? All these details are so important. Listen to my interviews with John Lewis. She's someone who hates Tallahassee. Now she wants to stay. She wants a staycation. She loves to go to, she wants to go to the park in the hottest weekend of the year. He's right on. All these observations are so right on for the right on. And finally he found someone who will listen. But it will, will this Will this prosecution come? Hard to know. Thanks, Ms. Rex Murphy. Just gifted five memberships. My understanding is that they'll be given out in random in the chat. Thanks so much. I'm going to actually take a quick break with... Just a little change of pace. Hold on one sec. I know we've all seen this before, but I think it's time for a musical interlude from the society page. And 
They're great video. Thank you, Jeff. Jeffrey Lacoste, please. There he is. Oh, oh Jeff, thank you for yeah. being here. No, seriously, Jeff, I mean it. Thank you, Jeff. My name is Jeffrey Lacasse, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y-L-A-C-A-S-S-E. -S -S -E. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, you seem quite, quite sincere. What? What's that music? <laughs> had told her that you know no man wants to date a single mom so we had this conversation repeatedly and then i show up to dinner and charlie's dating a single mom an extremely contentious divorce Jeff, thank you, Jeff. and wendy adelson drove me to charlie adelson's house at which point i I do recall observing that she was unusually jittery and being strange. I didn't know what to make of it at the time. Jeff, thank you, Jeff. She was a nervous wreck. Um, and I actually traveled to the store to buy her, I believe, some Pepto-Bismol. She was such a nervous wreck. She was having stomach problems. Thank you. So she wasn't food poisoned. She didn't have the flu. She wasn't sick. Just so... I don't remember that. Nervous that she was having stomach problems. Thank you, Jeff, thank you, Jeff, thank you. Well, yeah, you didn't go anywhere with Wendy without hearing about No, no. Dan Markell's. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff. Thank you. I was kind of tired of being strung along. Thank you, Jeff, thank you, Jeff, thank you. Jeff, thank you, Jeff, you can bet that he has tons of s***. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. I'm so fucking grateful for my Jeff. No further questions. All right. We can release the witness. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. You're free to go. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I'm so fucking grateful for my Jeff. Wow. Yeah, very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. You've been great, really. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming by. Thank you, 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 parody of Ariana Grande's Thank You Next that the Late Late Show did. Actually, I don't know when, a couple, couple years back. So I think he's one of the more fascinating, fascinating figures. Back to just take a listen to how he's describing. So he's gone from a relationship, has gone from calling each other baby, I miss you so much, to weird yoga, to meeting the parents, to canceling, I have to be back on that weekend. Very, all these very spot on observations. She's got a weird relationship with her brother. The whole family's odd. They, their pastime is hating Dan Markell. It was really strange at the time. I remember saying to my friends, like, when do you want to... People laugh. I said, when do you say she wants to do stay in Tallahassee? Like, she leaves town. I'm sure you know. Every chance she gets, she leaves town. Why? Jeffrey Lacoste wants to take Wendy away on a vacation. Wendy wants to staycation in Tallahassee, the Pobunk town. And we heard that in the prison tapes that Georgia Kappelman was the hometown girl who put everything for the jurors on a fourth grade level like a made-for-TV movie. Because, of course, 
Charlie Adelson's defense was so ridiculous and complicated and inconsistent with the evidence. It wasn't that it was a terrible, ridiculous defense. The way Charlie Adelson saw it, I had I had a story for everything. I can talk my way out of this. And you can hear him when he's talking to Katie in the wiretaps and the Dolce Vita. As long as you have a story for everything, you're covered. Even if it's your DNA, it could be there from before. You know, if they find anything, we, we can, we'll talk our way out of it. Doesn't work that way. Georgia Kappelman made a really consistent, tight, case against Charlie Adelson and all the other d defendants in this case. So I don't think it's going to go well for Donna. I think she, I think she's wasting her time with this. I don't think they I would have ever offered her a plea deal, but it's just good. I, I would be very surprised if she doesn't get convicted. I mean, the best thing I've, I've gone over it before, the best thing she has in her defense is also very strange. The, the bump, the conversation with the undercover and the bump. Anybody remember that? It wasn't me. It wasn't me. I'm telling you, it wasn't me. Remember that? Go get the money if you think you know, but it wasn't me. And then she's, it's it's all so contradictory and it doesn't make any sense. This is a family that doesn't have a problem with calling law enforcement when they when they need to. And they're going to let themselves get extorted. They also don't like paying a dime uh, more than they have to for anything. Why would she want to stay? I said, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, I finally managed to convince her to do a trip to St. Augustine but we had to schedule it so that we were back um, basically by the time of the shooting. Um, so that was just strange. It just it was peculiar at the time. Um, and she was, when we scheduled that trip to St. Augustine, I'm sitting her, she has her calendar open. You have to schedule everything with her. That's just how she was. Um, there was just, at the time, I can remember sitting in her office trying to schedule this, and there's this weirdness about that weekend. She was we're scheduling. Isn't it odd she has a calendar that she schedules everything? And I thought she scheduled everything by deleting her text messages once they were done. I think I thought that's how she she said she kept track of her appointments by writing text messages and then deleting them. So Jeffrey Lacoste is saying she actually kept a schedule book. Interesting. Very interesting. Other things, no problem. But that weekend, she just was intent on. That that day meant something to me before Danny was shot. Like, there's something weird about that week. I don't know what it is, but there's something weird about that week. If we keep going through uh, June, other things I noticed in June that were really crazy. Um, Let me back up a yeah, second so I get this right. Yeah. July 11th through 19th, you're supposed to go to California. Yeah. Leave on the 11th, come back on the 19th. I can look it up for you. It might be 12th to 19th, but it was the week that Danny was shot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when is she saying, I can't do it? What date What, what date are we talking about when she's telling you, I can't Early do it? Early June. I can pull up the exact Early date. June. Early June, yeah. So you're supposed to go to California with her, just you two. We have plane, plane tickets purchased. And she uh, called, she... Uh, Sat me down, I think it was June 5th or 7th. I will find out for you if you would like. Yeah. And she just said, um, I, I can't do that. And it just didn't make sense. It just didn't make any sense. So she'd already said that that date was those that window of... She said, this is the one week I have to go see your parents. And I 11th said, through the 9th. But that, that, that was in May we booked them. So three different times she canceled plans with me into a three-day period of What you're leading to is this is highly suspicious that she needs to be here on the 18th of July. Yeah, and just anecdotally, subjectively, whatever it's worth, it was really weird. It was really strange. I know this woman. I know her really well. Um, and there was something at the time with me saying to my friends, what's going on? It's just really, really strange. It's just really... This, she never... 
done anything like this before? No, she had canceled and recanceled, and she did that all the time. Completely disorganized person, but it usually made sense. It usually had a reason, and usually the reason was something about uh, court with Danny or the you know her parents wanted to come down to South Florida. She every other time about this, I understood. This time I was completely puzzled. Did it make sense? And it was very, very strange. Okay, so she cancels this trip to California. Did you go anyway? I did no, not. of course you didn't. You were oh, okay. Wish I had. <laughs> yeah. And so you. So what happens to these plane tickets? Um, her ticket, I have no idea. So you, she bought her own. Yeah, we, should, we bought separate plane tickets. As a matter of fact. So Detective Isom is just starting to get it. Just starting to get it. I don't know that she did buy a plane ticket. Oh. But she told me she did. Same airline? Same I so. flight? I can find out where I can send you my reservation. Because we had a discussion about getting our seats moved together. So I think she probably bought a ticket, actually. But I never saw the ticket. It wasn't discussed any further? I can't recall. Okay, so she, so that's the first thing. In early June, she says, Jeff, I, I got to be back on, on that Friday the 18th. Exactly to pick up the kids. I guess that's going to be the first of her week with the kids, maybe? Yeah, she gets the kids back after having, because they went to seven-day schedule in the summer. Right. And she's going to miss the kids. I, wanna, I said, well, we'll be back. It's not, I said, you don't want to go. Just tell me I don't want to go. No, I want to go. I just got to be back for the kids. It was a special... Okay, why not adjust the flight or adjust the... That, that well, she had the kids the previous week. This was her one free week. She's also booked all summer. Well, she? the 18th is a Friday. Yeah, it is. Okay, so, you know going back backwards um, the 11th would should have been a Thursday I'm thinking I can look it up but uh, it, it, it just wasn't she was booked week by week throughout the summer she didn't even have any school stuff right I mean I don't know if you're off during that no time. I'm, I'm completely off um, but what would you got from Wendy's police interview is she's got a whole network of people who are all useful to her in one way or another and they all seem to know a different side of her and her friend Jane anybody remember her friend Jane hold on I think do I still have it here yeah I do Jane McPherson social worker who hooked her up with Jeffrey Lacoste. She had totally had Jane wrapped around her finger, convinced, and, and Tova Walsh. So, sort of very much like her flying monkeys, willing to do her billing. Oh, yes, it's Jeffrey Lacoste. Come in, willing to point the finger right away. absolutely blind to how what a manipulative in my view manipulative dark person she is so she keeps a very social very busy social life also it's a part of her public image when detective isom says to her you have a lot of friends she's like well how do you know that she just seems like she beams well because you're having lunch on a minute's notice with a bunch of girlfriends so yeah, she just seems to beam at any kind of, you know, get real narcissistic supply from your eyes are so blue to you have a lot of friends. And Jeffrey Lacoste was going to be the patsy. Instead, he's continuing to be the thorn in her side. And her testimony about Jeffrey Lacoste is so interesting where she says, well, I don't like him so much anymore. Yeah, because he's publicly exposed you. Shown that not only are you not perfect, but you're deeply someone to avoid in life. Dangerous, highly manipulative, highly dangerous woman. Highly deceptive. Um, she has a lot of obligations to her parents. Her parents want her down in Miami every chance she gets. All through this county, there's parents, parents, okay. parents, parents. parents. All right, so so, so three, three different occasions, this 
at the time, it's like, oh, what's going on with the 18th of July or the week of the 18th? What is this? I don't understand what this is. This okay, is so the first thing is the California trip, and it's next. Yes. Yeah. Then you want to take her to St. Augustine. She's, you know, yeah, and she wants to stay, and that's just bizarre. But did you ever make plans to go to St. Augustine? Yeah, so a, few, um, a week later, again, we sat in front of the calendar, and it was really strange. There was this hesitancy about that weekend. Um, she says, I'll go to St. Augustine, but we have to be back early on Friday. Early on Friday? Early on Friday. Yeah. What is early on Friday now? Um, we were going to wake up and come straight back from St. Augustine, so we would have got up at 7, been here by 9 or 10. Okay. She had to pick up the kids from school until 4. It didn't make sense. Okay. Um, so I, but I said, fine. It might. I have to get back for the TV repair, Jeff. I have to repair my my broken my TV with a broken screen. I have the geek squad coming to fix my dorm style TV that couldn't be worth more than a couple hundred dollars that it, that has the oddly broken screen that looks like someone threw a you know sharp object to it that my kids vaguely vaguely injured this TV, right? <laughs> so bizarre i mean you couldn't make up these details if you wanted to i mean you could but they're just so they're so specific and so odd i mean they really covered all angles it's like they thought this out very much like what charlie adelson if you have a reason for everything well the tv broke and he's making the kids watch the t uh wendy's making the the kids and Jeffrey Lacoste for their special movie night watch TV on this broken TV screen when they have another TV in the other room that he's willing to hook up. She doesn't want the TV replaced because it has to be used at the right time for her alibi. So what's interesting is to me is, is to why she went out looking like that with her friends and what what was that lunch date about? And I, I don't get it. I, I don't I don't get it. Maybe she thought she'd be called earlier. I don't know. And she didn't have to go. I don't what do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. The thing was I was gonna drop her off and drive up to Atlanta. I was gonna drop her off and go. Um, so that was just strange. It just stuck in my head. Like, what? Because your trip, your trip to uh, your friend up in Tennessee, what was the date you were supposed to go? I was supposed to leave at about 10 or 11 a.m. on Friday the 18th. Okay. Because I was supposed to get, the original trip was to go straight to Atlanta, stay the night in Atlanta, then go up to Tennessee the next day. So I was supposed to leave here at 10 or 11 and get there. I'm going to move forward a little so, bit. Said it would cost about fifteen thousand dollars. Fifteen thousand? Yes, sir. That's what? So here's where he lays the heavy This is just paraphrased, but I want to make sure I yeah, understand. Yeah. Charlie did look into having Danny killed last summer. It would cost about fifteen thousand dollars, and that's. Not exactly word for word, but that's pretty close to what she said. Wish to God I had followed up. But how do you respond to that? What do you say? I want what did you say? I changed the subject to us. I was interested in working our relationship out. she ever bring that up again? No. Never again. But what worries me is that the speech pattern, not to be, I'm not trying to play FBI profiler here, but... It's kind of like, uh, I told you half a truth instead of half a lie. That's how she lies. That's exactly, I'm sure you've done that a lot anyway. So, uh, it doesn't have the impulse control just to say nothing in high stress situations, but it gives you this half mass version, yeah. Um, so I thought about that a lot. It doesn't have the impulse control to just say nothing. And that's what we've seen so much uh, in her testimony, making up the banana bread story, making up the kosher style food, saying that everything was great. It wasn't such a, it was an unpleasant divorce, but not a contentious divorce. When everyone else describes it as World War III, War of the Roses, the worst of the worst. 
She rather say something that's provably untrue, that's more convenient in the moment than just to say nothing. Or the other thing that she does is just to pretend that she has a bad memory. She doesn't recall, which is what lawyers tell you to do when you don't want to answer an uncomfortable or an unflattering question, meaning the answer is unflattering. You just say you don't remember because you don't have to commit perjury which is illegal. You don't have to risk your law license. There's no punishment for having a bad memory. But her version up there, the, just this, that she thinks that her style of speech, her demeanor, lacking all emotion is any way normal, is so bizarre. And I think it's one of the things that has gotten us all so captivated. <laughs> Who thinks that this comes off well, this head tilted to the side, this doe-eyed, parted lip, doll-like stare? Who thinks that that would be better than just go, and she has immunity, she's lying under immunity, in my opinion, and I think it's provable, saying she doesn't know how to spell gibbers. And Georgia Kaplan says, well, wasn't it programmed in your phone? She doesn't me remember key parts of the divorce, things that I remember. I mean, how does she, I think it's just to win in the, in the short term. It's better to make her make Georgia Kappelman look like the one who doesn't know and Wendy, the one who knows to temporarily win this battle and lose the war and feel like she won something and be defiant than just to go up there and tell the truth. Her mom's overprotective, but she's not controlling. Come on. Those emails are wild from from Donna to Wendy they're wild but you do remember the amount is 15,000 I do remember that no further than that nothing else there's nothing else right. I wish I followed up I beat myself up about this oh no, you didn't what am I gonna do call you guys and say my girlfriend said something crazy I don't know you know um, no. The thing that worried me about Charlie is he has a very close friend and goes on these trips with him who's ex-Special Forces and is known for being kind of deranged and it's all that guy was done by somebody who knew what they were doing. So I did, I told you guys that. What's his name though? I never I, got a name. I don't know. I assumed you guys investigated it. I don't know. He's a tatted up, uh, I mean known affectionately as a deranged guy. A guy just didn't come back the same like some of these guys do unfortunately. Um, but he's a close friend of Charlie's? On his Facebook page, that's what I told investigator Hill. Okay. Um, when I heard the crime occurred, about 12 hours, I was shocked. And then as I'm driving up by 75, in my head, I was like, holy shit, Charlie did it. And he got that guy, I can't remember his name, to do it. You're saying this guy is on Charlie's Facebook page, or I was? Was. I don't know if he is. Okay. These are really smart people. I wouldn't be Facebook friends with them anymore if any of this is true. Um, other thing that happened in June, our relationship isn't doing well. All of a sudden, from nowhere, you know like a five-year-old kid will try to manipulate you in a very transparent way, and it's like obvious what they're doing. She started doing that kind of stuff. I got the sense we weren't going to make it. It was obvious to me, and I didn't never going to trust her again. All of a sudden, she throws me the world. And if all at the time, I said to my friends, I've been very careful not to develop like a hindsight bias. I've checked back in with my friends. What did I say? They said, you said in June, it felt like Wendy was stringing you along for some reason. And you couldn't figure out why we... Why you very intuitive. And a truth teller. This would have made, this would have made him very unpopular among Donna and Wendy and Charlie. Because they all are live in an echo chamber where they all repeat each other and live in a fantasy. And the fantasy is we are the Adelson family. We are like the royalty family. Everyone wants to be us. Everyone, we are the most uh, smartest, sophisticated. We are, we, no one will tell us what to do. 
it's our money, our connections are the best, our word is the best. And here's the truth teller saying, no, this family is really very dysfunctional, very, uh, very antisocial, very dangerous. And for Wendy to have Jeffrey Lacoste, this was her ultimate revenge to have Jeffrey Lacoste come in to someone like Detective Hale and say, look, I'm telling you and be treated like a crazy person. The idea was to make him the patsy. Don't forget that. And I've done a lot of videos on it as far as oh, his car, the car that was rented was always a car that looked like by the by the people who were hired to do this always looked like Jeffrey Lacoste's car. He was he it was he was picked out. And you have to think about the kind of personality who could go from, oh baby, I can't wait to see you. I miss you so much. Oh, I'm coming to meet your parents. I want the kids to call you dad. To I need time apart. Right. Just convince right, right before Dan Markell's murder. Coincidentally, what I mean. Think about the person who would spend all this time and have her kids spend all this time and get attached to this person only to just throw him under the bus, to just use, uh, use and discard. So when he didn't make the trip, when he wasn't useful, she didn't want him around. He could only expose her. break up with you she's like this ain't gonna work you know so all of a sudden um she's telling me i i should uh, move in move in with her yeah she's talking about moving in she and i wanted a family so bad she knew that she manipulated me with the kids constantly um she said the kids should start calling you daddy i'm gonna talk to my mom and dad and i'm not jewish that was all they i to get approved by the parents I'm going to give you the passwords. I'm going to give to all my computer accounts. She started acting like this was going to be a uh, permanent thing. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. I can give you a thing. I'm just going to have to respond. To I understand. Right now. I understand. If anyone remembers Donna's phone calls to Charlie. Where, where she say those phone calls where she's saying Jeffrey Lacoste's testimony, he was twitchy and unbelievable. It is exactly the opposite. I find him an excellent witness. And she was saying June looked great because she's so done. You know, she comes so done up to court and it'll tell you everything about their values. So here's Jeffrey Lacoste. Being so insightful, nailing Wendy and the whole family has them pinned. And he's twitchy and red and untrustworthy. And June, who comes off, frankly, no offense, June, if you're listening, <laughs> but as an airhead, gets lost in the courthouse, comes in, takes a long time answering questions say do I still have let me see do I still have her hold on one second if I might have that opening I did so you can see what it, hold on one second please hold guys just want to show you this just compared to Jeffrey Lacoste let's see if I can find it real quick just to show you June a little bit of June's testimony here we go. So this isn't her testimony in Charlie's trial, but it will give you an idea of what her testimony is like. Spell your name. J-U-N-E. Do you know Charlie Adelson? 
Yes, I do. How do you know Mr. Adelson? Um, he's my ex-boyfriend. Oh, did you have any contact with Donna Adelson during this time frame? No. Do you remember being on the balcony of the Icon where Mrs. Adelson lives, having a conversation with her about this case? Um, briefly. All right. And what was her demeanor? If you, do you know what I mean by that? How was she acting? Yeah, I know what demeanor means, but she was, um, everyone was obviously upset about this and if, you know, she, it wasn't, she wasn't happy, so. She was stressed out, right? Yeah, of course. Um, did she have puffy eyes? I don't remember. Did she complain about not sleeping? Um, mm, possibly. And did she make a statement to you about Dan Markell? Um, yes, I believe so. What was that statement? Um, just that all, everything was awful and it feels like, um, you know, like, it's, I don't know, I don't really, I'm sure you have it there. So. I do. Do you know what it is? I kind of briefly remember, but, um. Did she say that she feels like Dan's back from the grave, like haunting her? Um, I I don't know, like if they were those exact words. I think she was just so frust like stressed out and upset that that's how it came out. So, so there is Juna Machada, her testimony that it, it was very much like the testimony, only the testimony in Charlie's trial was even more, more spacey, more protective. Uh, Charlie threw goo goo eyes at her the whole time. And Donna thought it was wonderful. And she looked so beautiful. And she was so wonderful and polished. So it'll tell you, it'll tell you, you know, June was really still, she said about Charlie, that if he, except for this slight problem with him being, uh, possibly being a murderer, he's a perfect man for her. So it'll tell you her thinking. But I think I've made my, I think I've made by the point I was going to make in this, which is, uh, what if Wendy did it, why she did it was really to, because she was going to be publicly exposed. She was going to lose a lot. When we talk about the kids and I really think the kids are much more of a motivation for Donna than Wendy in this. And that the real motivation was to preserve her law license, preserve her, phony public image as a crusading, caring, connected, not a deeply troubled, deeply deceptive, deeply dangerous woman in truth, but her public image was of a caring crusader for victims and dedicated teacher, dedicated mother. All that was being exposed and her family family was being exposed to. I think it would have been humiliating for Donna to have to say that she was having supervised visitations. So please leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. Am I right? Is Wendy, is Donna, is Charlie, is Harvey, or is this a family of antisocial personalities? Why was Jeffrey Lacoste chosen? Was he just useful? Did, was he underestimated? Let me know in the comments. Please hit the thumbs up. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, leave me a five-star review, and I'll be back tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern with another live stream. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. Have a great night.